and my name is Joseph Conti, and today's webinar is being presented by Sh Shannon Jordan McKenna, who is the MIAS Project Coordinator and Lead Trainer. Shannon, I can turn it over to you for the presentation. Good afternoon and welcome to the MIIS Immunization Updates presentation for 2023. My name is Shannon Jordan McKenna and I am the MIS Project Coordinator and Lead Trainer. I have been asked to disclose any significant relationships with commercial entities that are either providing financial support for this program or whose products or services are mentioned during my presentation. I have no relationships to disclose. During this presentation, I may discuss the use of vaccines in a manner not approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, but that is in accordance with ACIP recommendations. Today's presentation will include an overview of the MIS, a progress update for both the MIS and MyVax records, tools and workflows for managing patient data, instructions for keeping site information up to date, details regarding updates to various reports available in the MIS, and information about upcoming system enhancements. We will begin with an overview of the MIIS. The Massachusetts Immunization Information System is a secure web-based system that collects and stores immunization records for people of all ages that have been vaccinated in Massachusetts. The MIS provides clinical decision support in accordance with an increasingly complex vaccination schedule. The MIS can help to identify when an immunization has been missed and prevents over-immunization by providing up-to-date vaccination information. The system is also used by public health systems to assist with monitoring and controlling vaccine-preventable diseases. Utilizing the MIS contributes to higher immunization rates and a healthier population. Per the state legislation, providers located in the state of Massachusetts that administer immunizations are required to report those immunizations to the MIS. This infographic shows some of the data sources that are reporting data and have access to the MIS. These sources include boards of health, eVitals, pediatric offices, schools and school-based health centers, pharmacies, primary care providers, hospitals, community health centers, and any other provider site that administers immunizations. The MIS also receives interstate data. Last year, we began receiving data from the state of Rhode Island, and we have plans to onboard with other states in the near future. Now we will move into a progress update for the MIS and MyVax records. Here we have a visual representation of the MIS's growth since its launch in 2011. As you can see, when the system first launched, we onboarded nine sites with 3,900 patients and 69,000 shots. Fast forward to today and we have 4,492 onboarded sites with over 10 million patients and almost 110 million shots. We can also see the growth of sites onboarded for bidirectional data exchange since its implementation. Initially, we had 294 sites onboarded for bidirectional data exchange with 2.7 million queries. We can see here that those numbers have grown to 3,108 sites onboarded for bidirectional data exchange and over 330 million queries as of February 2023. The MyVax Records portal was launched in January of last year. MyVax Records allows patients to access their MIS records through an online portal and download their full immunization history or their COVID-19 certificate. When using the portal, patients can download their Smart Health card to their phone to have their COVID-19 vaccination information available to them at any time. Providers are also able to print and provide a patient's smart health card directly from the patient's record in the MIS. The COVID-19 Certificate of Immunization, available under Immunization Reports, contains the smart health QR code. 
Since the launch, there have been over 2 million registration attempts for the MyVax Records portal. Of those attempts, 69% have been successful, resulting in over 850,000 unique successful registrations and over 820,000 unique records accessed. These numbers are reflecting the amount of unique successful registrations and records accessed and does not include the numbers for successful registrations from the same individual multiple times. Patients are encouraged to reach out to their provider for assistance when they are unable to access their record in the MyVax Records portal or when they observe an issue with their record. If a patient is unable to contact their provider for assistance, they may submit an amendment request directly to the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. As of February 2023, the Department of Public Health has received over 19,000 amendment request forms. At the time this data was collected, 99% of those requests had been processed. All amendment requests are currently being processed within our SLA of 10 business days. With so many sites accessing the MIS, as well as the availability of data through the MyVax Records portal, the management and accurate reporting of patient data is crucial. In this next section, we will cover the tools that are available to aid in managing your site's data. With thousands of sources of data coming into the MIS, a deduplication algorithm has been designed to accept, evaluate, and determine when two records belong to the same patient. When the algorithm cannot determine if two records are the same or different, the records are sent to a deduplication queue for manual review. The MIS provides sites with two deduplication queues, one for patient records and the other for specific immunizations that have been reported. Actively managing your site's deduplication queues will ensure the most accurate representation of your patient's information. If you are unsure if two records are for the same patient, it is recommended that you do not merge the records. There are multiple ways to access the deduplication queues for your organization. Links to each queue are available under the Take Action section of the MIS homepage. The Take Action area also details the number of records that are in need of review. The queues can also be accessed in the Patients module either by hovering over the Patients tab and selecting each queue from the drop-down menu, or by clicking the Patients tab and selecting the button for each queue on the Patients landing page. Additionally, a link will be present in a patient's MIS record when that record is included on either queue. Selecting this link will bring you directly to the review and resolve screen for this patient. As you can see, the patient deduplication queue has undergone some enhancements. Differing data elements are now highlighted yellow on the review and resolve duplicate screen to increase visibility. We have also expanded out certain data elements, such as patient name and phone numbers, to offer more availability when choosing which data elements to keep on the consolidated patient record. Links to the patient's phone and email histories are also available on this screen, which can offer more information when determining if two records belong to the same patient. After you have reviewed the patient information, there are three options available for resolving the duplicate record. Selecting these are the same patient will result in the records being merged. Selecting I don't know if these are the same patient will keep the records separate and remove them from the queue. However, they are still able to be merged if more information becomes available. We recommend choosing this option if you have any hesitations about the records belonging to the same patient. Selecting these are not the same patient will remove the set from the queue and they will no longer be considered as potential matches. This option should only be selected if you are sure that the records are for separate patients. Another significant update for the MIS was the integration of Smarty, which we can see represented here on the Review and Resolve Duplicate screen. Smarty allows for real-time address cleansing and validation. Upon saving a record, patient addresses are verified and formatted in accordance with the United States Postal Service database and standards. 
The green check mark and text reading address verified indicates that the entered address matches the USPS database. A red exclamation point and text reading address not verified indicates that the address was not found in the database. This can mean that the address either does not exist or is not registered with the USPS. Moving on to the duplicate immunizations queue, it is important to note that actively managing immunizations will ensure the most accurate representation of your patient's vaccination history when running reports. As you can see, differing data elements will also be highlighted yellow on the Review and Resolve screen for potential duplicate immunizations. When resolving duplicate immunizations, the user can choose an option from the drop-down menu to select an action for each dose. Selecting I don't want to take action at this time will result in no changes. All immunizations will remain on the patient record and the record will remain on the duplicate immunizations queue. Selecting is a duplicate of another vaccine, delete it, will result in the selected dose being deleted. Selecting should remain on the patient record will keep the selected dose on the patient record. And selecting does not belong to this patient will prompt the user to submit a record correction request. The record correction request page will open directly from the review and resolve screen. The selected dose will be automatically selected in the report inaccuracy column. The user will need to provide a reason for the record correction request as well as enter their contact information in case follow-up is needed. It is important to enter as many details about the incorrect immunization as possible so our team can better assist with correcting the patient's record. If you are providing direct care to a patient, we encourage you to review their immunization record for new information that was not previously available to you. Patient information should also be updated in the MIS when new information is provided. If you notice an error on a patient record, you are strongly encouraged to correct the information with the most accurate patient data. The information on the demographic tab of a patient record, such as name and address, are editable. Sites that are onboarded and set up to send data to the MIS are now able to update patient demographic information via HL7 messages as well. Additionally, providers can enter historical information into a patient's record. Historical immunizations should be added to a patient's record when documentation of prior immunizations administered at another facility is obtained. Entering this information results in more accurate patient immunization records and can prevent duplicate shots from being administered. The provider scorecard provides an assessment of the completeness, accuracy, validity, and timeliness of the data that has been electronically submitted to the registry by your organization. The scorecard indicates if the information in the application meets or does not meet expectations. This table outlines the different scoring categories and their descriptions. Each area that is being assessed will be assigned a score of problem, poor, okay, good, or excellent. The data used to determine scores comes directly from all active patients associated to your site within the MIS application as of the last completed month. Any changes made to your data during the current month will not be reflected until the next month's update. We recommend that you review data on a quarterly basis to ensure that the information your site is sending meets and exceeds expectations. There are two ways to access the provider scorecard for your organization. Users can navigate to My Site on the top right side of the MIS homepage and then select Provider Scorecard from the My Site landing page. Users can also access the detailed scorecard from the Provider Scorecard graph that is present on the MIS homepage. This graph displays where your organization falls in relation to other organizations of the same practice type with your organization's score represented by a red bar.
The inventory decrementing tool generates a list of vaccines that were not deducted from inventory when saved to a patient's record. The tool allows users to correct errors for the immunization and correctly deduct the vaccine doses from their inventory. Users can navigate to the inventory decrementing tool by hovering over the reports tab on the MIS homepage, hovering over vaccines, and then selecting inventory decrementing tool from the drop-down menu. Alternatively, users can click the Reports tab and select Inventory Decrementing Tool from the Vaccine section of the Reports landing page. Additionally, the tool may be accessed from the Vaccine Management Dashboard. The tool is also available to review when placing a vaccine order. After entering the necessary input parameters and selecting Submit, the Inventory Decrementing Tool will open in a new tab on your browser. Each row in the tool will list a specific immunization that did not decrement from inventory. It is important to review the immunizations listed in the tool to determine why they did not decrement. Specific fields that can affect proper decrementing of a vaccine are editable and can be changed directly on the inventory decrementing tool. Once updates to the appropriate fields have been completed and update immunizations has been selected, the doses will decrement accordingly from inventory and will be removed from the inventory decrementing tool. The corresponding immunization record will also be adjusted to reflect the corrected data. The HL7 admin console allows users to review and monitor the HL7 messages their organization is transmitting to the MIS. Users may also opt into receiving an HL7 summary email that contains a table of all messages received and whether they were successful, had warnings, or failed. The monitoring of provider HL7 feeds is vital for timely and accurate immunization reporting. The MIS now stores additional information from all HL7 messages to include in the new inventory audit report, which we will discuss later in this presentation. Further updates include the ability for the MIS to accept demographic-only updates and the addition of logic, which allows providers to delete shots via HL7 messages. Further updates to the HL7 admin console include the addition of the HL7 demographic-only update message details report. This report produces a list of all HL7 demographic update messages sent within a specified period and whether the information was accepted and updated on the patient's MIS record. This report can also be used to view specific messages for specific patients using the MIS ID or MRN filters. Please note that messages will only appear here if your site is reporting demographic only updates. If you are interested in submitting these messages, please contact the MIS Help Desk for more information. The structure and location of warnings present in the weekly HL7 statistics email has been reformatted to match the structure of the HL7 message summary report. Both the weekly statistics email and the message summary report now also display information about demographic updates. We recommend that you review this information routinely to remain informed of your organization's metrics of data submission via HL7, including message counts, successes, and failures. If you would like to receive the weekly HL7 summary email for your organization, you can do so by updating your email preferences on your MIS account. In addition to managing patient data, it is also important to ensure that your site information remains up to date. An MIS Access Administrator manages user access to the MIS for a registered site. Access Administrators can manage MIS user access at their organization by navigating to My Site and then Site User Management. This will bring the user to the Access Administrator dashboard in the MIS Resource Center, which opens in a new browser tab. Access Administrators have the ability to invite new users to register, deactivate users that are no longer with their organization, promote existing users to the role of Access Administrator, and resend user invitations. 
Here we have some additional information about the different ways that an access administrator can manage user access for their organization. When inviting new users to register, it is important to note that each individual using the MIS must register and receive a unique username for accessing the system. User accounts must also be registered using a unique email address. Login information cannot be shared by users as this violates the MIS user agreement and creates a security issue. For security purposes, a user's MIS account should be deactivated as soon as the individual leaves your organization. If a user account remains inactive for a period of 24 months, the account is automatically deactivated. Every site must designate an access administrator to manage user access for their organization. The person who initially registers a site is automatically set as the first access administrator for that site. Organizations are encouraged to have more than one registered access administrator. Existing AAs have the ability to promote an existing user to the role of access administrator. When new users are invited to register, they are sent an email containing their registration invitation. The new user must review their information and electronically sign the MIS user agreement in order to register. The invitation remains active for 30 days. Access administrators can resend a registration invitation to the new user if needed. Invitations can only be resent to users that are in invited status. Any registered user can submit a request to update the site or onboarding information for your organization by accessing the registered user dashboard. Selecting Update Organization allows the user to change site information such as name, address, NPI, and organization contacts. It is important to note that this flow cannot be used to update enrollment information. Enrollment information such as shipping address and contacts must be updated with the Vaccine Management Unit. Selecting Create Onboarding Request will allow users to submit a request to update their site's EHR system. It is very important to inform the MIS of an EHR transition so we can establish data exchange with your new system. When submitting the request, the first question will allow you to indicate that this is an EHR transition and provide the date your site is making the switch. Once the request is submitted, the MIS interoperability team will proceed with a new onboarding project to ensure that your new EHR system is reporting immunization data to the MIS when you make the switch. Failure to inform the MIS of an EHR transition will mean your site is not properly reporting data to the MIS, which could impact your compliance with state requirements, cause problems with your inventory management, and affect future vaccine orders. In this next section, we'll discuss the new inventory audit report as well as updates to the COVID-19 coverage report. The inventory audit report gives a high-level view of events affecting inventory, which can be used to gather information for reconciling inventory discrepancies. The report can be accessed by hovering over the Reports tab on the MIS homepage, hovering over Vaccines in the drop-down, and then selecting Inventory Audit from the drop-down menu. Alternatively, users can click the Reports tab and then select Inventory Audit from the Vaccine section of the report's landing page. When running this report, the date range cannot exceed six months and the earliest date that can be included in the report is two years prior to the current date. This report can be run for all vaccines in a group or for specific vaccines. The inventory audit report outputs into an Excel file and displays data in four worksheets. The summary tab contains information about the selected vaccines or vaccine group that were adjusted during the date range entered on the input parameters screen. This tab includes information about the individual vaccines that were adjusted during the time frame entered for the report, as well as all inventory information for that specific lot number. Each lot number of the selected vaccines will be on its own row of the report output and vaccines will be separated by private and state supplied as well. The Patients tab includes patient information related to the vaccines listed on the Summary tab. 
This tab will contain a list of patient immunizations reported by your organization that includes vaccines matching the CVX on the summary tab, regardless of the date the shot was administered. In other words, all patients that received a dose of any vaccines listed on the summary tab will be listed on the patients tab, even if the dose was administered outside of the date range entered on the report. The HL7 message summary tab includes data about the HL7 messages related to the vaccines indicated on the summary tab. If the immunization sent through HL7 was rejected, this message will still populate in this tab. Each row included on this tab will represent one RxA segment. Finally, the Input Parameters tab will include the information that was entered on the Input Parameters screen when the report was initially run. The COVID-19 coverage report provides a convenient way to generate a report exclusively for COVID-19 coverage of patients. This report can be accessed by hovering over the Reports tab, hovering over Patient, and then selecting Coverage from the drop-down menu. Once redirected, users may select COVID-19 coverage report from the list of available report types. Users may run the report using input criteria which will include patients from a selected age range. Alternatively, a list of patients may be uploaded to run the report. Users are also able to check Include Patient Listing Tables for an Excel output that lists specific patients included in the report. The COVID-19 coverage report follows the MIS Immunization Forecaster logic to determine patient vaccination status. The report has been updated to include four immunization statuses. Up to date represents the patients that are up to date with their COVID-19 vaccination at the time the report is generated. Primary series complete, but not up to date, represents the patients that have completed their primary series but are due for a booster shot. Primary series started incomplete represents the patients that have started their primary series but have not completed it and no dose represents the patients that have not received at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine. When include patient listing tables is checked on the report input, the Excel output will include information about the three most recent COVID-19 doses that are present on each patient's immunization record. The output will indicate the total number of COVID-19 shots on each patient's record and will identify patient records that are flagged as potential duplicates that are requiring manual review. As we approach the end of this webinar, I wanted to remind everyone that the MIS offers various resources for utilizing the MIS, including many on the topics discussed during this presentation. Training materials and MIS resources are available in the Training Center and Resources sections of the MIS Resource Center. There are two ways to access the Training Center and MIS resources. Both can be accessed directly via the links on the top right corner of the MIS homepage. Alternatively, individuals may visit MISresourcecenter.com and access both modules via the Resource Center homepage. The Training Center offers training materials in the form of mini guides, training videos, and recorded webinars. The available materials cover a wide range of topics such as navigating the patients, vaccines, school, and reports modules, data quality information and data reporting, and utilizing my site. As previously mentioned, we have various materials available regarding the topics that were discussed during this presentation, as well as many others dedicated to different functionalities in the MIS. We also have supplemental immunization materials available, such as fact sheets, immunization schedules, vaccine information sheets, and other immunization-related resources. In addition to the materials found in the Resource Center, users are also able to register for live webinars that address various functionalities available in the MIS. The webinars include an overview of the topic as well as a live demonstration and Q&A. All webinars are also recorded and posted in the MIS Resource Center. All MIS users are also automatically subscribed to a monthly newsletter that covers important changes to the MIS, 
upcoming releases, training opportunities, as well as helpful resources, tips, stats, and things to know. The MIS newsletter is sent out on the first Monday of every month. I also wanted to give a brief overview of some of the upcoming enhancements that will be coming to the MIS. Some items that we have coming soon to the system are enhancements to the storage and handling report to include lot number and the date the issue was reported. We have some updates coming to the HL7 admin console to include more detailed information when a shot is marked as success with warnings. And we will also be creating a new flu coverage report that will use the current season to determine up-to-date status for patient flu immunizations. I would like to thank everyone for attending this immunization update session. We will open the floor for a live Q&A, but if there are any lingering questions, I have included the contact information for the MIS help desk here, as well as the URL for the MIS Resource Center. Thank you for your presentation, Shannon. Um, there are a couple of questions in the Q&A, but if you have other questions, feel free to enter them in the Q&A below. Um, the first question we received was, what happens when data sharing is turned off? Um, so if a patient's data sharing is set to no, that is going to um, keep whatever immunizations are reported from each provider only viewable to the provider that reported them. Um, so let's say a patient has their data sharing set to no and they receive an immunization from both their uh, primary care provider as well as their um, local CVS. So the CVS is only going to be able to see the immunization that they report um, and the primary care provider is only going to see the immunizations that they've reported. Um, each provider won't see the immunization reported by the other provider. Great. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, another question is, can your site only resolve the deduplications for patients in your practice? So your site's deduplication cues are going to be specific to patients that you have um, given immunizations to, or if it's the immunization deduplication queue, it's gonna be for immunizations that your site has administered. Um, each patient will show up on the deduplication queue for every provider that's um, associated with their immunization record. Um, so if we take the case of the primary care provider and the local pharmacy, again, if there's a potential duplicate patient, that duplicate patient is gonna show up on both of those um, duplicate patient queues to be resolved. Okay, perfect. Um, another question was for the COVID report, how do you know that it is pulling from your patient pool? Do you upload a list? So the COVID-19 coverage report, um, there are, you can run it two ways. So you can either run it for the patients that are active at your practice. Um, so that's going to look at all patients that are in the MIS active with your site. Um, or you can use the COVID-19 report upload template, which allows you to upload an Excel file with specific patients to run the report for. Um, and if you use the template, I don't believe the um, patient would necessarily have to be active at your site. But Joey, I don't know if you have any more clarification about that specific point? Um, no, yeah. So I would say the best way to, to ensure that it's pulling from your patient pool is, is to manage your patient listing in the MIS. There is a way that you can log in and, you know, um, 
look at the patients that are associated with your site. And if you need to make changes to any patients, you can do that so that, you know, patients who maybe are no longer part of your practice aren't um, being counted in your reports. Um, okay, another question we have um, is how do we determine how to fix certain areas on the provider scorecard? For example, how do you fix timeliness if um, vaccines are automatically updated to the MIS? Um, so Joey, I think I'm going to defer to you a little bit more on this question. Sure, yeah. So if, if it looks like, you know, there's a delay with the way your immunizations are being reported to the MIS, but you report electronically, I would definitely um, reach out to your EHR vendor to make sure that, you know, there's not a problem with the connection. You can also reach out to our help desk and we can um, try to take a look at that further. You, you know, if um, if you're reporting automatically, but you, but you do enter it into your system at a later date, that could be another reason why timeliness is is um, being impacted. I would also make sure that if your site is ever entering um, historical immunizations that you're sure you're entering them as historical because if you accidentally enter them as administered and they're shots from a long time ago, it, the system's gonna think that you're um, reporting some administered shots at a, at a way later date. But if you think there's um, a delay with your immunizations being reported and it's impacting timeliness, I think your EHR vendor would be the best um, folks to reach out to. Um, another question that we received is, sorry, a couple just came in. Um, I've experienced great difficulty while attempting to use the inventory decrementing tool with regard to COVID vaccines. Any recommendations? I can talk about that one as well if you'd like. Yeah, I was going to say I'll defer sure. to you for that one too. Joey. Um, yeah, so I would say, you know, we definitely recommend that you monitor your inventory decrementing tool regularly so that um, you can stay on top of any reporting issues as they arise rather than letting them kind of build up. Um, depending on what the issue is with the inventory decrementing tool, you know, there's different, a couple different ways that you would want to address them. Um, I do want to state that the inventory decrementing tool is designed to be a catch-all. So not every dose that pops up in your inventory decrementing tool is necessarily an error. It's just a catch-all that, that shows every dose that didn't deduct in the event that you need to make an edit to one of those. Um, but again, not everything in that decrementing tool is necessarily something that needs to be corrected or addressed. Um, if you have specific questions about your inventory decrementing tool, decrementing tool, I would definitely recommend reaching out to the help desk and one of our interoperability coordinators can go through the tool with you and give you some recommendations about how to, spe uh, how to fix specific immunizations that are showing up for you. Um, okay, let's see another one. Is there a way to inactivate multiple patients from a practice after they have transferred to another practice? Um, yeah, so if you, um, If you run the um, practice population report, then you can use that report to um, generate a list of patients and you can change their status at your practice um, through that report um, specifically. That way you don't have to go record by record. You can just use the report um, to go in and set multiple patients to inactive kind of in one go. Um, we have the resource for that report listed in our resource center. Um, and if you wanted more information about that, you could um, contact the help desk as well um, with the information that's up on the screen currently. Okay, great. Um, 
Another question was, what does reconciliation timing mean in the inventory decrementing tool? And I can talk about that one. Um, when you place a vaccine order in the MIS, part of the process of placing that order um, is to confirm the inventory that you currently have on hand. So it'll, <clears throat> excuse me, it'll display a, you know, list of the doses that you, that the MIS believes you currently have in your inventory and you're asked to confirm those numbers. Um, so if you confirm those numbers, but then you try to retroactively report or deduct immunizations from before the date that you confirmed those numbers, the system's not gonna allow you to deduct those doses because if you're trying to deduct a dose that, that was administered on 530, but on 531, you confirmed the numbers in the MIS, it's going to think there's an error and therefore not allow you to deduct that dose. So if um, that's an issue you're seeing, I would reach out to the vaccine unit and ask them to um, remove any doses from your inventory that you need removed at that point, because at that point, the system's not gonna allow you to deduct them through the inventory decrementing tool. Um, okay, let's see another question. This question says patients are calling for immunization since they were younger that are being requested by work slash school. Can you print them out for them? Um, so any provider that has access to the MIS has the ability to print an immunization record for a patient directly from their MIS record. Patients can also request their records um, through the MyVax records portal, and they can also request them directly from um, the Department of Public Health. If they are looking for childhood immunizations, unfortunately, since the MIS um, was started in 2011, it's less likely that older immunizations will be in the system. Um, however, if those patients had a record of receiving those immunizations, um, any provider with access to the MIS could enter them in as historical immunizations and then print the record for them as well. Okay, great. Um... Someone did also just ask, are the slides of this presentation available? I don't see a link. Um, I believe, Ted, you did mention that the, the presentation would be posted after um, this webinar, correct? That's right. We'll uh, have the um, this webinar, recorded webinar, on our materials page. And that link is in the chat. So if uh, folks want to just copy that or send me an email, I'd be glad to forward uh, the URL to you. Okay, great. Um, another person wrote that they received the HL, weekly HL7 email and um, they had one with a success with warning. What does that mean and what do they need to do? Um, yeah, I was gonna... on, yeah. Yep. <laughs> so the success with warning basically means that um, the immunization, that particular immunization was successfully reported to the MIS, but it was missing a required field. Um, so if you'd like, you can reach out to the help desk and we can look at that particular immunization with you and look at what field um, was missing. The best way to avoid those success with warnings is to ensure you're entering every data field in your EHR when you enter an Im administered immunization. But um, the good news about a success with warning is that the, the immunization did still make it onto the patient's record and was absorbed into the system. There's just a, um, you know, a piece of information missing, maybe like the lot type, um, which is still very important. But when you see an error, that means that the immunization totally did not make it into the system at all. So that's something you'd want to address, um, you know, more quickly, but, but a success with warning, you can look at that particular immunization and see what field is missing and then update it or just know in the future, 
to make sure um, you can't make sure you're including that data field whenever you enter an administered immunization. Um, another person says that they received the weekly HL7 summary email, but it says no data. Um, if you are, if you didn't report any immunizations that week, you know, some sites maybe only administer flu shots. And so during the summer, you're not reporting any immunizations. That could be a reason why you're seeing no data. But if you're um, concerned that you are actively administering immunizations in your weekly HL7 summary is saying there's no data, I would reach out to the MIS help desk so that we can take a look and make sure there's nothing wrong with your connection. Um, another person asked, is there a list of EHRs that integrate with the MIS? Um, yes, there is. If you wanted, again, to reach out to the help desk, we could provide you with a list of EHRs that are currently capable of integrating with the MIS, or if you have a particular EHR that you work with now, um, feel free to let us know and we can let you know what the options are for that specific vendor. Okay. Um, there are a couple more questions in here, but these questions that I'm seeing are very specific to particular patient records or particular sites. And I think some of these questions would be better to discuss directly with the help desk. Um, so if you did submit a question about our particular patient record or um, something along you know those lines, I would reach out to the help desk so that someone can look at that a little more closely with you um, over a phone call or an email. Thank you again for joining us and we hope you enjoyed our presentation. Please feel free to follow up with us for any additional questions. Uh, again, the uh, email addresses uh, are in the chat box and uh, links and materials and events page are there as well. Uh, we'll leave this uh, the chat box up for a couple minutes if folks wanna uh, just copy those addresses and do feel free to email me uh, for any other follow-up questions. Uh, and this recording will be up in about a week or two. So again, thank you so much and have a great day.